Good morning, everyone. This is Erica Potis speaking. I'm an instructor with the RSA program, and I want to welcome you to this fourth and last session of this webinar series. Uh, today, we have a guest speaker. He is Dr. John Lin from the Department of Atmospheric Sciences from University of Utah, and he will be talking about the use of OCO2 and OCO3 data to look at urban carbon emissions. Uh, we're very grateful for his, uh, his time and presentation today. And I will uh, leave the floor to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lin. Okay, so um, today I'm gonna talk about uh, urban carbon emissions and specifically the use of space-based carbon dioxide observations to understand urban carbon emissions. And my name is John Lin and um, I'm a faculty member in the Department of Atmospheric Sciences at the University of Utah. And just to situate you in terms of where we are in the whole series of training, this is the last part um, in a four-part series in terms of the training. And I wanted to call out uh, parts one, and one, two, and three in case you haven't uh, listened to them. Um, because today I'm really just gonna focus on urban emissions. Um, I won't talk about the use of the satellite data, the XCO2 data, uh, for global carbon cycle studies. That's part three by Abhishek Chatterjee. Okay. I also won't talk about the nitty gritty details of how to access and visualize the data. Um, that's part two by Karen Yuen. Um, and also uh, just gonna really touch on really briefly the, the how the CO2 measurement works. Um, if you are interested in the details, please see part one by Vivian Payne. Okay, so why do we care about urban areas? Um, in, in many ways, the global population has passed a milestone um, in, in, in this century in which more than half of the people around the world reside in cities, okay? And cities are where a lot of CO2 emissions are happening and they are responsible for significant emissions. Also cities by definition are places where a lot of people live and, and there are also a lot of emissions. So there are air quality issues and the concentration of people means that um, a lot of human beings are being exposed to these pollutants. Okay, so in many ways there is a linked uh, issue between air quality and climate change happening. Okay, so the cities are where a lot of action can take place. So in terms of a glass half full point of view, um, cities, because they're responsible for so many emissions, can also be the place where a lot of reductions happen. And this prominent group of cities around the world called C40 cities, some of the most prominent cities um, this group has, has uh, come up with a report and did some analyses and have indicated that actions at the city level alone can actually result in a lot of reductions in carbon, okay? They've sort of estimated that city actions alone can deliver actually 40% of the Paris Agreement goals in terms of carbon reductions. Okay, so while cities are responsible for a lot of these emissions, they can also be the place where a lot of carbon mitigation emissions reductions can happen. So um, we want to understand uh, the sources of carbon in cities. And these include power plants right here, okay? These include cars, okay? vehicles, um, they include emissions from buildings and homes, uh, aviation, okay? At the same time, we as humans also breathe out uh, 
CO2. Okay. And vegetation in cities, they both take up CO2 and release CO2. Okay, they take up CO2 through photosynthesis as well as releasing CO2 through respiration. Okay, so there's this, this mixture of different sources that um, emit or take up CO2 from the atmosphere. At the same time, the atmosphere itself moves the CO2 around and mixes it. And there is the mixing height, um, which is indicative of how high the mixing takes place. Okay, and that defines the height at which the dilution of the surface emissions take place. Okay, and that is also important consideration because um, from, from research standpoint, okay, we take uh, the observed CO2 in the atmosphere and we were trying to figure out the emissions from that. Okay, in order to do that, we need to understand how the atmosphere moves CO2 around, how deep this mixing takes place, and the hope is to, to really use the measured CO2, okay, whether in the lower atmosphere or from satellites, like we'll talk about, to understand the emissions from cities, okay? And, and there are potentials to understand emissions in different parts of the cities, also the emissions of different kinds of sources. Um, so that is, uh, uh, um, example of a research problem that we tackle in the research field. Okay, so here's some of the, the, the key scientific questions that's motivated our work at least um, over the past several years. One is how can atmospheric CO2 be used to understand urban carbon emissions like what I just mentioned, if you measure CO2, how can we use that to understand um, emissions in cities? Secondly, once we figured out um, the emissions from a city, how do those emissions vary between different cities? Okay, one can imagine different cities having quite different characteristics, you know, cities in the US, cities around the world, okay? How do emissions vary between them, okay? And then thinking about this linkage between carbon and air quality, how can co-benefits be realized in reducing carbon emissions and improving our air quality? And if you think about these sources like vehicle emissions, carbon greenhouse gases are being emitted along with other pollutants like NOx, carbon monoxide, PM 2.5, etc. So there's hope that um, by reducing emissions of carbon, we could also improve air quality. So this is referred to as co-benefits. One of the co-benefits, very key co-benefit, is the improvement of air quality with the, the reduction of carbon. So, so those are all key scientific questions that underlie a lot of our work these days. Okay, so let's take a look at how um, some of those questions are being addressed uh, in the place where I live, uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. Okay, so I'll show you some examples of studies from Salt Lake City, okay? So let's zoom into the Salt Lake area, okay? Salt Lake area lies at the heart of this region shown in the red box, and that's Northern Utah. This region is referred to as the Wasatch Front, okay? Because it lies along the Wasatch Mountains. And this is a, a region as you can see from these night lights pictures that um, are, are relatively dense, uh, dense for the Western US. And um, this is where 80% actually of Utah's population reside. 
Utah's population right now is about 3 million. So actually over 2 million people live in the Wasatch Front. Okay, and at the center of it is Salt Lake City and the Salt Lake Valley, okay? And one of the things we're, we're quite proud of here in the Salt Lake area is uh, um, one of the longest running urban CO2 networks in the entire world. Okay, so uh, we at the University of Utah have been measuring CO2 in this urban area since 2001, actually. So over 20 years now. And uh, this was started by my colleagues in the biology department. And I've sort of taken over responsibility and actually have also expanded over the years. But the locations of the CO2 measurements are shown here in these red symbols, okay? And there are a variety of these in different locations at different um, elevations, okay? Including a mountaintop site here to measure background CO2, okay? We also have uh, measurements on light rail that I'll talk about later on, okay? Now, a key point I wanna mention is that these measurements are ground-based measurements. They're, they're measured near the surface, okay? And we'll see the difference between these type of measurements and the satellite measurements we'll talk about later. Okay, but I'll start off with talking about CO2 measurements near the ground. So this network, as I said, was, was started in 2001, actually right before the Salt Lake Winter Olympics. And the idea here is to really try to understand and monitor emissions from the Salt Lake urban area, okay? The idea is really to see whether there are changes and they understand why the, these emissions, if they're changing or not changing, what's happening, okay? So with such a, a long record, okay, um, the, 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 the important question we can answer, okay, with this sort of multi-decadal data set is, how have emissions changed in Salt Lake area? It's a very simple question, but it's actually kind of rare that we have the data to try to answer such a question. Okay, so what I'm showing he here are the observations over many years in different sites in the Salt Lake area. Okay, each one of these three letter codes refers to a ground-based site in um the map shown here in the middle okay so let's uh, let's take a look at the longest running site which is the university of utah campus site okay so that's the data here now in order to understand the urban emissions we need to account for the background or the baseline okay that's shown here in black okay the black line, okay, you can see it's some sort of baseline level. And this reflects emissions from around the world. In fact, it really reflects um, the, the atmospheric concentrations outside of the city. And you can see some smaller variations and also upward trend as CO2 builds up around the world, okay? Now to isolate what's happening within the city, we need to subtract this out, okay? Because we don't want contributions from the rest of the world. Just want to focus on the city itself, okay? So what, what, what you're left with are these violet areas, okay? So if you focus on the violet area, that reflects emissions from within the city, okay? Now, what you also see when you look at the violet area is that there's a very distinct seasonal cycle with the concentration being higher in the wintertime and lower in the summertime, okay? Now, there, there are a variety of reasons for this. One is that in the wintertime, um, there are emissions associated with heating, 
Okay, so there, there are larger emissions happening in the winter. Also in the summertime, um, that's the growing season. So the vegetation is taking up some CO2. Okay, so that draws down CO2. Okay, also you remember what I said about the mixing height and the depth of this height, okay, which is called the boundary layer. It's shallower, it's, it's not as high in the winter time. So that means for the same amount of emissions, the concentrations build up more. You're concentrating the emissions within the shallower layer of the atmosphere. And vice versa, in the summer, the mixing is deeper. So you're diluting the same amount of emissions into a deeper layer. So the concentration doesn't build up as much. So it's this, this seasonal pattern of the mixing depth along with changing emissions and fluxes from vegetation that's causing this very distinct seasonal pattern, okay? The seasonal pattern is something that contrasts, uh, say the winter and the summer, we're still left the question with, well, how have emissions changed over the many years? Okay, so that's the analysis we did and the results are shown here. Okay, the results here are shown for the U University of Utah, UOU site. Okay, and these lines are the trend lines. Okay, what you're seeing is the excess CO2 over the background, okay, that violet area, as a function of the different years. Okay, so, um, whether you look at the whole year or just the winter or just the summer, the trend is pretty flat for the UOB site. Okay, that means that emissions probably haven't changed very much over the years, okay, because trend line was pretty flat. Likewise, if you pick a site like this site, the MUR site in the middle of the Salt Lake Valley, also pretty flat trend, okay. Interestingly, if you take a site like DBK here in the southwestern part of the valley, okay, this is more in the suburbs, actually, in the early years, it was very rural, okay? So it's, it's rural to suburban these days. This site starts off with a very low excess CO2, not much excess CO2, okay? but there is a pretty distinct upward trend at the DBK site, okay? So this, there's a contrast between what's happening in the suburbs or the rural areas versus in the heart of the urban valley, sort of more mature development, okay? What we think is happening is that um, in the mature urban landscape, per person emissions have gone actually down, okay? Because Salt Lake area, the population has increased, okay? But the excess CO2 has remained pretty flat, okay? So the excess CO2 represents the total emissions by a larger population. So we think the population per capita emissions have gone down over time. Okay, whereas in the daybreak area, the per capita emissions are changing. And this is because people in the suburbs um, per capita is expected to emit more, okay? They live in bigger houses. They need to drive for longer distance for work and services, okay? So we are observing this contrast between the urban core and in the suburbs from these atmospheric measurements, okay? So this kind of results has been um, hinted at by uh, people who look at urban planning or socioeconomic data, but it's one of the first times we're actually able to observe this from the atmosphere, from atmospheric CO2 data. So we think it's pretty cool. This is uh, sort of verifying what the people who use socioeconomic data to do these calculations have um, suspected.
Now we can also compare these uh, results derived from the atmospheric data against Salt Lake City government's estimates of carbon emissions. Okay, and these are results taken directly from this report shown on the bottom right from the Salt Lake City government. And they have done um, sort of spreadsheet type accounting of the carbon footprint from the entire city. Okay, and what you're showing, what you see here is uh, the contrast between 2009 and 2015 carbon footprint. Okay, and what you see, if you look at this number, that's the total carbon emissions in terms of CO2 equivalent from 2009 and 2015. Okay, if you look at these numbers, you can see that the emissions remain pretty flat, okay? Maybe have gone down a little bit, okay? And that is actually in accordance with what we're seeing in the atmosphere, okay? Now, I should say that we can't directly compare these results. It's, it's a little bit of apples and oranges comparison, okay? Because these are, um, emissions locally as well as emissions from electricity which is emitting outside of the city so that's kind of a, a tricky point but the broad stroke sort of result is 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 matching what we're seeing in the atmosphere which is that salt lake city proper okay um the emissions have not changed very much over the years and this is part of a sort of a, a long-term goal by the Salt Lake City government, okay, to reduce um, greenhouse gas emissions by 80% by the year 2040. Okay, this is a goal that um, our former mayor, Jackie Biskupski, has, has outlined while she was um, holding office. And this goal has continued to be re reaffirmed by the current mayor. Okay, so this is one of those Salt Lake City's long-term goals. And I should say th these types of urban carbon reduction goals are um, quite common these days by a lot of municipal governments to try to reduce carbon emissions. And what we hope to do is to work with the government and um, try to monitor these changes as they happen over the next several years. We're going to try to monitor from the atmosphere. That's one of the powers of atmospheric measurements and calculations. Let's talk about air quality. Earlier, I talked about this, this coupling of the carbon and climate change and air quality. And this is very much the case here in Utah, especially in the Salt Lake area. And what I'm showing you here is a, a newspaper article from the New York Times um, entitled, Seen as Nature Lover's Paradise, Utah Struggles with Air Quality. And in many ways, this um, headline is, is, is very striking because um, Utah, if you've been here, um, probably recognize is in many ways nature lovers paradise. Um, we have these beautiful mountains, uh, fantastic skiing and hiking, but we also have these episodic air quality events. And what you're show, uh, what you're seeing here in the picture is what we call the wintertime inversion event. Okay, what happens in the winter is that often we have warm air sitting on top of cold air and that is a pretty stable configuration of the atmosphere. So that stable air does not mix very readily. What that means is the population, uh, sorry, the pollution then builds up on the bottom part of the atmosphere. It accumulates and you can see the haze accumulating in the bottom part of the atmosphere. And sometimes the haze uh, gets pretty, pretty thick such that uh, the people in the city, if you're down in the lower elevation, actually can no longer see the be beautiful mountains around us, okay? And of course, the mountains also help 
to trap the pollution. Okay, so it's you have this sort of uh, um, double whammy from the atmosphere and the geography. Okay, that traps the pollution. So during these episodic air pollution events, there's a, a pretty heightened awareness of our air quality problem by the general population. Okay, and this is also where we can observe um, very strong signals of the buildup. Okay, and here's what I'm showing you here from um, the top of our, our department um, building where we, this is our laboratory on top of the building. And we observe greenhouse gases like CO2 and methane along with air quality relevant pollutants like carbon monoxide or NO and NO2, the combination of which is called NOx, and then PM2.5, okay, or fine particulate matter below. What you can see here from these panels is um, this, this really strong um, co-variation between the greenhouse gases and these air quality relevant pollutants. When CO2 goes up, okay, a lot of these other species also go up. And let's focus on the times that are shaded in gray here, okay? These are the times when um, this inversion happens, when the warm air sits on top of the cold air, trapping the pollution within the Salt Lake Valley. And this is a long one here in uh, February 2016, in which uh, the inversion lasted for about a week, actually. You can see the CO2 going up, building up over multiple days, as well as methane and the other air quality species. What we do during these times is really use the entire Salt Lake Valley as a pollution chamber and observe these things build up. And from that, we can understand um, something about the emission sources, okay? And that type of analysis uh, can also happen. And that happened in other times like this really unique event that we all lived through, which is the COVID shutdown in spring of 2020. Okay, so, so during that time, during the shutdown, um, there was a major change in human behavior, a lot less driving happening as people worked from home. And we could see what happened to the atmosphere, okay? And this is what we saw in the Salt Lake area from our CO2 measurement sites, okay? These three panels are from three different sites, okay? On the y-axis is the excess CO2, the, the additional CO2 above the background, okay? And then on the x-axis is the hour of the day, okay? Generally, the excess CO2 is higher during the morning rush hour. You can definitely pick that out, okay? It drops during the day, and then there's a secondary peak in the evening rush hour. Okay, now what we did is contrast 2020 in black against the pattern from previous years shown here. Okay, so for both of these sites, UOU and SUG, we definitely saw a drop in 2020. Okay, probably no surprise there due to the reasons we just talked about. Okay, what's interesting again, is this site in the southwestern part of the valley, okay, in which 2020 was higher than the previous year, okay? So that, that long-term trend upward in the southwestern part of the valley with the suburban development and, and the, the emissions there has continued through 2020, okay? So again, you're seeing this contrast between the mature urban part and then in the suburbs. Now, what happened to air quality? Okay, what I'm showing you here 
for the same type of plots, but for NO, NO2, ozone, and then PM2.5. Okay, NO, you see a very distinct, pretty pronounced drop. Okay, and that's expected because NO is um, tends to be freshly emitted from tailpipes. That's one of the major sources of NO. Okay, NO2 is oxidation product of NO. Okay, but you also see this drop throughout the day. Okay. PM2.5, you also see a drop, okay? Interestingly, ozone, you actually see an increase, okay? Why is that? Um, we think this is atmospheric chemistry at play because NO actually reacts with ozone, okay, um, to form NO2, okay? Especially at very high concentrations of NO. This happens right near roadways and highways. Uh, very pronounced signature. When you reduce NO then, you have less conversion of ozone to NO2. Okay, so this is called uh, NOx titration of ozone. Okay, and that strength got reduced when you reduce the amount of NO and NO2. Okay, so when you reduce the amount of NO emissions, okay, this ozone titration got weaker, so you actually have an increase of ozone, okay? So, so interestingly, we had a slightly increased ozone level, okay? And this, this type of pattern has also been seen in other cities around the world. Okay, now let me show you another type of surface measurement, okay, that we're, we're quite um, excited about and, and proud of. These are the measurements of um, surface level air quality and greenhouse gases using light rail. Okay? What we do is to instrument a, a box, put instruments in there that are uh, operating in an autonomous fashion and let the light rail train carry the instruments around as it moves around. Okay, the light rail train is part of the Utah Transit Authority's um, track system. It's a, it's a major part of the public transit. Okay, so we're letting the public transit carry our instruments around, moving along the surface. Okay, and what's great about this is that you can actually um, monitor and characterize pollution and greenhouse gases at intersection as the train moves through. Okay, so it's, it's a very granular, um, beautiful pattern of, of pollution and greenhouse gases that you can understand uh, in great detail. So this is what you get in terms of the CO2 distribution that you can observe by the light rail, okay? And this is the pattern that you see when you average the data uh, in July and August 2015, okay? So the train is just moving along. This is one of the lines that moves along, okay? It goes from the airport, um, goes through the city. Here's another one that goes from the university, goes through downtown, and cuts through the urban corridor, and then moves to the Southwest, to the suburbs and um, to the rural area, okay? So you can see a lot from this pattern, okay? You can see, first of all, these major intersections. See this red area, uh, which indicates high CO2, okay? Also, the height of this bar also indicates the level of CO2. So there are two indicators for the level of CO2. You see the color and the height. Okay, so you can see the major intersection here that shows up as a very high level of CO2. You also see generally higher CO2 in the downtown area. Okay, you can also see the, the change in CO2 as you move to the suburbs, these, this lower level that's showing up. And also as the train 
goes to a higher elevation to the university. Okay, that also shows up as this, this sharp drop in CO2 as the train climbs the hill up to the university. So that's a very rich data set. Okay, now we get into the question of how do we then analyze these surface-based measurements? Okay, so let me back up a little bit and talk about the information that's present in atmospheric CO2 observations and how to interpret it. Okay, so when you measure CO2, whether on the ground or later on, we'll talk about um, the satellites. Okay, it's carrying information from the upwind area. Okay, and it's carried by the atmosphere. It blows the signals of the emissions, okay, to the measurement location. In addition, there are uh, contributions from outside of your domain, okay? So that's the boundary conditions that's shown here, okay? And you can think about the atmosphere then as an information transfer channel, okay? It communicates information about the emissions, okay? And depending on what you measure, you can get information about a variety of stuff. Okay? If you measure CO2 and methane, you can understand carbon emissions and fluxes, um, as well as if you're interested in vegetation, you can potentially get information about um, ecosystem stress. If you measure pollution, okay, you can understand information about pollutant emissions. You can also measure water vapor or isotopes of water vapor and you can talk, uh, you can try to understand hydrology, okay? Now, in order to decode this information carried by the atmosphere, you need a model of the atmosphere, okay? So you need to go back and attribute the information you get to the upwind area. Okay, that's indicated by this arrow here, okay? So you need to decode this information through a model of the atmosphere, okay? And if we think about the atmosphere as a communication channel, okay, it's actually an imperfect one because it doesn't carry the information perfectly because there's mixing that could destroy information, okay? You can think about there are different um, sources of emissions, let's say, okay, if the atmosphere mixes perfectly, instantaneously, then it's pretty much impossible to regenerate information about the individual sources, okay? So that's a, a example of the loss of information due to mixing. Okay, fortunately, the, the atmosphere doesn't mix instantaneously perfectly. Okay, so we can actually still retrieve some information about individual sources. Okay, but it's not a one-to-one -one perfect communication channel. There's some loss of information. And we have to use a atmosphere um, that is sort of modeled in our computers, okay, atmospheric model, which is not a perfect representation of the atmosphere. So there's also some loss of information or errors there, okay, or uncertainties, okay? But we have to often use such a model in order to attribute the information we get to the upwind emission sources. So let me give you an example of a model that we use a fair bit. This is called the stochastic time inverted Lagrangian transport model or STILT. Okay, and I'll play a movie here to illustrate how stilt works. Okay, so if you focus your attention on the left-hand panel, you see a lot of these little, little circles. They represent the, the individual pieces of air, okay, that are modeled in our um, representation of the atmosphere, okay? And they are emitted from this black circle, that's our measurement location, okay, also referred to as receptor. And from there, 
this ensemble of little pieces of air or ping pong balls, <laughs> um, they go backward in time, okay? And they disperse, they move actually in a 3D fashion, okay? And you'll also see the contrast between the red balls and the blue balls, okay? The red balls are staying near the surface, okay? These are the balls that are affected by surface emissions. The blue balls are higher up in the atmosphere and they are not affected by surface emissions. Okay, so there's a contrast here, okay? But it's all taken care of by the model because we're being um, three-dimensional here and simulating the motions of these parcels of air um, in full 3D fashion. Now what's happening on the right, okay? The, the right-hand panel is drawing a map using the red balls. The red balls, are the ones, remember, that are close to the surface, that are being affected by the surface emissions. Okay, So this uh, region is the region marked out by the red balls. This is the, the potential source region, the potential emission area that can affect our um, measurement location. Okay, And this changes with, with time, with space, because the atmospheric motions change um, for each location and time, okay? So these simulations are quite high resolution and they're performed at each measurement time and location, okay? But it's really valuable information because then we can, we can attribute what we measure to a particular geographical region, okay? We know the rough, sort of sensitivity or of our measurement to a potential source reach. Okay, so let's see the example, okay, of what you get. If you take the light rail line, okay, and run this model for a long period of time, okay, this is the source region that you get, okay. Um, this source region has a name and we call it the footprint, the atmospheric footprint, okay? And this type of information becomes really valuable for interpreting the observation, whether it's the ground-based observation or the satellite observation that we'll talk about. We can also generate the same for the fixed locations, but you can see this reddish sort of high footprint region, okay, high sensitivity to source region is concentrated right around each fixed location. So there's a difference between um, the mobile measurements and the fixed location. But suffice to say that um, both provide information about urban emissions, okay? And if you're interested in the details on exactly how much information, what kind of information such a exercise provides, I um, encourage you to read this paper by Derek Malley. Now in part two of my talk, um, I wanted to zoom out and um, talk about understanding carbon emissions from cities around the world. Uh, so we're going to zoom out from the Salt Lake area and look at cities around the world. Okay, and, and this is probably the time when you're thinking, well, John, you've been talking a lot about ground-based measurements. I thought this was training about satellite data. That's what um, exactly we're gonna talk about in part two, because we are confronted with a fundamental problem when we talk about um, trying to understand carbon emissions around the world, because we generally have a lack of high precision CO2 measurements in most cities. Okay, what we have in Salt Lake is great, um, but it's kind of rare to have that level of CO2 measurements. So this is where satellites come to the rescue, okay? And namely OCO2, Orbiting Carbon, um, orbiting carbon Observatory 2, and OCO3 later on. Uh, OCO2 was launched on July 1st, 2014, and uh, it measures reflected sunlight. And from the absorption, okay, of things like oxygen and CO2, you can back out the 
column averaged amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. Okay, so it actually is the average CO2 concentration over the entire atmosphere column. That's quite different than measurements right near the ground. Okay, and, and we'll see the implication of that pretty soon. Okay. Um, as I said earlier, if you're interested in the details of how you get from the reflected sunlight to column averaged CO2, um, I encourage you to look at part one of this training series by Vivian Payne. But I'm just going to leave it at that and um, really provide you some more high level applications of this column CO2. Okay, this column CO2 is called XCO2, X referring to the column, and we'll see how it uh, is, can be used. Okay, so this is a look at this column average CO2 or XCO2 from OCO2. Um, and you really see the coverage around the world. Um, you, you really, thanks to the satellite, have this multiple orders of magnitude increase in the measurement density and number around the world. You have measurements over the ocean, over land. Um, and, and because of that, we have the opportunity now to use this data to understand uh, emissions from different cities around the world. Okay, now the coverage is not perfect. Um, you can see that the measurements take place along a pretty narrow track, okay, each time, okay, and there, there are gaps where there are clouds, um, often where there, there are, um, uh, say, high ice, okay, and also in higher latitudes, the coverage is weaker, uh, not as dense as well. But even given those limitations, it's, it's really quite a extensive coverage. Okay, so given that coverage, we're able to ask the following question. How do emissions vary between a pretty uh, typical North American city to the left, in which uh, it's more sprawled out, less dense in terms of population density? By the way, this picture is from Atlanta, okay, versus a city on the right, which is much denser. This is Tokyo, okay? And we can ask the question, do denser cities, like the right one here, okay, emit less carbon to the atmosphere per capita, okay? And this question has been looked at uh, before by people who, who, who look at social economic data. For example, this is a classic study from 1989, looking at per capita annual gasoline usage, okay, in different cities. And that is plotted uh, against urban density, okay? And you can see the relationship here with um, denser cities like Hong Kong way here, okay? And, and, and having less per capita annual gasoline usage, okay? And that kind of analysis has been re repeated here in the US, okay? These colored dots represent uh, emissions from, from transportation per person, okay? Plotted against um, population density again, so that the pattern is repeated, okay? So the question again is, can we see this in the atmosphere? Okay, these are both constructed using socioeconomic data, what we call inventory analyses. Okay, we call these bottom-up analyses. Okay, can we see them in the atmosphere? These uh, the atmospheric studies are called top-down. Can we have the top-down match the bottom-up? That's where the satellites come in. Okay, and in order to analyze the satellite data. Um, we again need a, a model of the atmosphere, okay? So um, this work, as well as the work I'll show you later on, um, is from 
my former PhD student, Dian Wu, who's currently a postdoc at Caltech. And what she was able to do is to take the stilt model that I showed you in the animation with the, the little balls going backward in time and adapt it for satellite analyses. Okay. So remember the satellite is measuring the column averaged amount of CO2 or XCO2. Um, so this model, because you add an X is called X stilt. Okay, so the, the usual model is, is called stilt, but the, the adaptation of it to analyze the satellite column data is called X stilt. Here's another movie illustrating how X stilt works. Okay. And you're seeing this desert landscape because we are focusing on Riyadh, okay, which is the capital of Saudi Arabia. So um, you have, let's say, a measurement from the satellite measuring a column here. What you'll see then is the column distribution of the ping pong balls representing a little piece of air going backward in time, okay? And that is the movie shown here. Okay, you start off with the column. You can see pretty soon the column tilting because of wind shear, because of differing winds at different altitudes. Okay, so you have the column tilting. In this movie, you can also see the little balls changing colors as they go over the city. And that is representing the emissions from the city causing changes in concentration within these little pieces of air. Okay, so that's why they change color as they move over Riyadh. Okay, and you can see, especially from this movie, um, the real three dimensional nature of this. Okay, and there's also the time dimension that they go backward in time. But using the model like this, we can map out the footprint of the satellite measurement while attributing the signal we see two different parts of the urban landscape. Okay, so, so a tool like this becomes really important as you can see later on. Okay, so which cities did we analyze? We analyzed about 20 cities around the world for, for this analysis. We picked cities, first of all, that have enough coverage by OCO2, okay, about six to nine tracks per cities. And we were also careful in choosing cities that are, are in relatively dry environments. We also um, minimized the analysis to focus on the winter time, okay, or the non-growing sense. And that's because we want to focus on the human emission component and really minimize the, the contribution from vegetation. Okay, so that's why we picked the dry cities as well as the winter time to, to minimize the, the potential interference in terms of signal from the vegetation. Okay, let me give you a sense of how we analyze the data. Okay, so here is one of the OCO2 tracks passing over Las Vegas in the US, okay? And if you look at the colors, there's the reddish colors that show up over Vegas, okay? Causing an enhancement in the XCO2, okay? Now there's another way to visualize this. Here, I plot the latitude versus the XCO2 amount here, okay? If you look at the data from the satellite, there's a bulge here. Okay, there's a blip here. Okay. Presumably, this increase is due to uh, emissions from Las Vegas. Okay. If you look at how big this this bulge is, okay, it's about two parts per million. Okay. That's the signal you get in in a decently sized city. Okay, if you recall what we saw in the ground-based measurements in Salt Lake, the signal is actually something like 20 ppm, okay? That's pretty typical, okay? sometimes even larger. 
Okay, so one of the realities you face when dealing with the satellite data is that the urban signal is much weaker than if you measure near the ground, okay? That's because the urban signal from the emissions is being diluted over the entire atmosphere column. So there's a trade-off here, okay, that we have to live with, which is that the urban signal is diluted over the entire atmosphere, okay? But that's okay, we still have a signal, okay? What we have to do also is define the background, okay? And that's the, the concentration of air that's not affected by the city. So that's um, derived by looking at observations outside of the urban plume, okay? And we, we, we show that by this dashed green line taken from the average of the concentrations outside of that plume, okay? And we actually also account for the, the potential error in this by the scatter here, okay? But now we have the background, we have the enhancement, we subtract the background from, the, the, from these higher values. We also integrate over the latitude. It's, it's a bit uh, like talking about the area under this curve, okay? And that is, the the urban signal that we work with. Now we run the model, the X tilt model, to attribute that track to different parts of the urban landscape. Okay, we run the model from each part of the track. Okay, to look at the source region. This is the combined source region. Okay. Then we superimpose the source region with a population map, okay? We're trying to get the per capita emission, so we need to know how the population is distributed, okay? And you combine everything and you get this quantity here that I won't go into it for detail. But you take the area under the curve, that urban signal, you divide by the thing I just pointed out this population weighted in latitude, weighted column footprint, and voila, you get per capita emissions. The units certainly work out. Um, and it may seem kind of hard to follow, which, which I agree with um, because I went over it so quickly. But if you're interested, I encourage you to read Dian's paper that's shown here in the bottom right. Um, that, that describes this in more detail, okay? But what we have is now a methodology to take the satellite data, okay, and um, understand per capita emissions from cities around the world, okay? So we did this calculation for the 20 cities, and you end up with a relationship like this, okay? So this is the um, per capita emissions on the y-axis versus the population density on the x-axis. I should mention that um, this has been plotted on the log-log scale, okay? But you can see that in this relationship, okay, the higher population density cities like Seoul or Dhaka, okay, are associated with lower per capita emissions, okay? So what we've done through this analysis is verify, I think perhaps for the first time, the relationship between per capita emissions and population density, okay? And this relationship is what we call sublinear. What this means is as population growth grows in a particular area, the emissions doesn't grow as quickly, okay? That's an, another way of saying that per capita emissions goes down as population density increases, okay? So this is pretty cool and sort of similar to what I said earlier about um, what we found in Salt Lake. Um, not surprising probably for a lot of people who, who look at the socioeconomic data, but again, tested for the first time using atmospheric CO2 data. 
okay, in this case using satellites. So it's pretty cool, but there are limitations. Um, first of all, there is a limited sample size of cities, just 20 really. And for that matter, focused on more dryish cities. Okay. Also, each city's emissions is, is calculated, um, sort of averaged. And, and so there's no temporal variation. We're not trying to um, look at how emissions varied from year to year, which would be really nice. But for sample size reasons, for OCO2, we could not do that. We had to aggregate the data over multiple years in order to do that. Okay, so those are two uh, uh, limitations of, of this work. But the good news is that um, we are trying to address these limitations, we and others, okay? And how are we addressing these limitations? Okay, first of all, we are looking at cities beyond dry ones. Okay, in order to do that, we need to get a handle on um, the carbon sort of fluxes that are associated with vegetation within or around the cities. How do we do that? Um, there's a really exciting sort of a source of data that we're making use of also from satellites. And this is called Satellite Observed Solar Induced Fluorescence or SIF, okay? And essentially, SIF is measuring the plant's glow, the photons coming from plants, okay? And these photons are emitted um, in the photosynthetic me uh, mechanism of, of leaves, okay? Actually in the chlorophyll, okay? So actually these photons, the fluorescence that we measure from space has a close linkage to photosynthesis. And work over the past 10 years or so has shown that SIF is a very good proxy for photosynthesis, okay? By measuring these, this, this leaf glowing from space, you have a very good handle on photosynthesis by plants. So this is, this is really great and um, another really valuable source of information we have from satellites. So what we're able to do is to take this as one of the key drivers of a new model of urban biological carbon fluxes, okay? And this model we call SMURF. Um, again, work from Dian Wu's PhD. And what she's able to do is to generate maps like this. Okay, so this is a map of um, biological fluxes uh, in, in Europe, actually. So you can see the maps um, centered around London to the left, okay, and then Paris to the right, okay. What you're seeing is um, the photosynthetic map here in green, respiration in brown, the net here compared against the fossil emissions of CO2, okay? So what this means is that through the use of, of SIF and a model like this, we now have a handle on the biological fluxes in um, cities that have, have that are not as dry, okay? London and Paris were not among the cities we analyzed before, um, partly because of the vegetation signal, but now we actually have a handle on it through SMURF and SIF in particular. Okay, so that, that is the direction we're heading in terms of accounting for the urban biological carbon fluxes, again, with the help of satellites. Another really exciting source of data is using the follow-up mission to OCO2, which is OCO3. And OCO3 was launched on May 4th, 2019, and uh, it's in orbit on the International Space Station. Unlike OCO2, OCO3 has a special mode focused on cities. This is called the Snapshot Area Map, or SAM. The way it works is that um, instead of a single track over a city, 
it can actually collect multiple tracks, essentially scanning over an entire city. Okay, what you're seeing here is Los Angeles, okay, mega city, a huge um, sort of urban area covering a pretty wide region. Okay, but, but OCO3 through the SAN mode can actually scan over a lot of the LA basin, okay? What this allows us to do then is potentially to both zoom in to different parts of the city and zoom out, okay? You can, you can get sort of urban-wide emissions as a single number, but also focus on different parts of the city. So that work is very much in progress. And let me just show you some of the earlier work. Um, and this is work from a uh, PhD student, Dustin Roten, who also ran XTILT and simulated the XCO2 in the LA basin. Okay, this is a comparison uh, from the simulated against the observed from OCO3. Okay, this is from October 2019. Okay, you can see a lot of different features that are showing up. Okay, from the more downtown area to um, the outside. Okay, so there's a lot of gradients that are being shown here, both in the simulated and in the observed. Interestingly, here is um, another observed pattern. Okay, just a little over a week later in October 2019. And what you're struck by is how different the observed and the simulator are on this day versus this day. Okay, there are a lot of uh, plumes, for example, here, but, but also you can see that uh, the signal is weaker on this day. Okay. And we think this is due to weather, meteorology, okay? And this also points to the importance of using uh, a model or atmospheric observations of the weather to try to interpret this data because you can see just visually the difference between one day to the next. Okay, so, so this is um, pretty exciting data that we're combing through in terms of the sand mode city observations and um, I think there'll be lots of more exciting results that can come thanks to the combination of OCO3 and OCO2. Okay, so in closing, I just want to thank um, my research group uh, and also honorary research group members shown here, as well as the many sources of support that our group has received over the years in carrying out this work. If you're interested uh, in the details of what I've shown here, here's a listing of uh, many papers in which I have pulled from in today's presentation. So I encourage you to look at them for a lot of the details, but also here's my contact information, okay, as well as the link to the training page. And that's all. Thanks for your attention. Great, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Lin, for that great presentation. Uh, super interesting uh, looking at these emissions at the urban scale. So now let's uh, start our question and answer session. We've been gathering the questions that many of you have been writing on the questions box, and we've put them into a Google Doc that you see on your screens. Uh, we will be making this Google Doc public. We'll be posting it on the uh, 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 training page for this webinar. Um, before we start the Q&A, I just want to remind everyone that there is a homework associated with this training. We will post that homework on the training webpage uh, um, by Monday. So please check back and the due date for that homework will be June 23rd. All right, so let's get started with the uh, Q&A then. 
Uh, we'll just start from uh, the, the question number one. Can you please clarify in slide number 21, correlation between CO2 and other pollutants? If the correlation and measurements were done with OCO or ground-based tools? Go ahead, Dr. Lin. Okay, hey, so um, those were all done with ground-based measurements. So anything you see in the sort of slides from part one were based on ground-based measurement. The idea there is really contrast the information that you get from ground-based measurements versus um, versus uh, sort of satellite measurements, and, and you know, there's sort of pros and cons of both. Great, thank you. Question number two. On slide 26, CO, PM 2.5, and NOx are listed for observing ecosystem stress. Could you explain this relationship a bit more? What references uh, do you suggest uh, to read about this? Yeah, so I, I sort of apologize. That might have been a little misleading in terms of my two columns of, of bullet points. So actually, the I didn't mean the the left column to map one to one on the right hand side. So I actually didn't mean for CO PM 2.5 and NOx to be directly used for ecosystem stress. Instead, I was thinking more about something like CO2 because from CO2 variations, you can get a sense of the ecosystem carbon fluxes, sort of the topic of Abhishek's uh, sort of training number three, the one before mine is focused on that, looking at the natural vegetation and oceans. And from, from, from those calculations, you can actually get um, a sense of what the ecosystem is doing, including e ecosystem stress. So from CO2 alone, you can get a sense of that. Um, now, CO, PM 2.5 and NOx, I was thinking more about uh, pollution instead. However, I'll just take the opportunity to mention SIF again. The, the satellite observes solar induced fluorescence, which is a real uh, gem in terms of understanding photosynthesis. Um, and I, I mentioned that in the talk. So if you're interested in sort of ecosystem stress, I would highly encourage you to look at SIF. Um, and there's actually a whole RCEP training focused on SIF. And the link is actually posted in the Google Doc there. That is correct, yes. Thanks for that reminder. That RCEP training was a little over a year ago. Okay, question number three. Great question. It says, Dr. Lin mentioned that this city action that can deliver 40% of the Paris Agreement. Remote sensing CO2 measurements sometimes do not show the specific sources of these CO2 emissions. Therefore, how do you use remote sensing atmospheric CO2 emission trends to convince decision makers to help them take real action toward the Paris Agreement? Yeah, so this is a really valid question. And uh, it sort of goes back to question one in terms of ground-based versus satellite measurements. Ground-based measurements have much more uh, signal and also you can sort of hone in on specific sectors, specific parts of the city. Um, what the satellite measurements offer uh, at least the, the, the current sort of established work is, is you can get uh, decent estimates of whole city emissions. So what is your city emitting? Um, and that alone could be valuable. You know, and I'm thinking about decision makers having specific policies to try to reduce emissions. Is that really showing up in the atmosphere? Um, and in, in some ways that that is the bottom line because we're trying to prevent CO2 from building up in the atmosphere. So, so whatever enters the atmosphere, uh, you know, could stay there. So we want to reduce total city emissions, period. Um, that being said, uh, as I sort of talked about in the talk, OCO3 and some of the, the satellite measurements being planned in upcoming years have potential of providing more granularity in sort of zooming into different parts of the city covering the city. So um, that work, I would say, is still kind of new and being developed. 
the, the capabilities to develop really granular emissions from different parts of the city and different sectors. Okay, question number four. In slide 49, how do you define a city with heavy power industries? Yeah, so what we looked at is actually an emission inventory, the socioeconomic um, sort of uh, estimates, what we call bottom-up estimates, not using the atmosphere. And there are some pretty detailed numbers already associated with each city in terms of what they think the power emissions are. And I believe we ratioed it against uh, more area emissions. And, and certain cities really jump out in, in having a very high ratio. And um, again, if you're interested in this, the real specifics, I encourage you to read uh, DMU's paper in environmental research letters. Great. And the reference to those papers is in the uh, PowerPoint presentation for anyone interested. Uh, question number five, since a city may not be fully captured in a single tile, how do you create a complete atmospheric image of the area? With Sentinel data, you would merge adjacent tiles to cover the city's full extent. Can you please elaborate on this challenge? What tools to use? Any algorithms to consider? Yeah, this is, a, a again, a, a very valid and great point. Um, let's start with OCO2. So OCO2 has a narrow track. Sometimes it's directly over the city. Sometimes it's upwind of the city, downwind. You know, you're sort of at the mercy of the track. And from that track, we have to rely on the winds or atmospheric transport to carry information from different parts of the city to try to piece together a, a fuller picture of its emissions. So one of the tools that, that uh, I would use uh, is, say, an atmospheric model, trying to reconstruct those winds and, and how the air arrived at your track. Now, um, something like OCO3, I mentioned the SAM mode, it's more of a mapping tool. So you can actually scan across your targeted urban extent. So you, you can actually get a pretty good coverage of the entire city. So that's a pretty exciting sort of new data set that we're still coming through and, and trying to figure out exactly how to pull together the emissions from different parts of the city. So it depends on, um, again, the sensor you use and how you would use it. Okay, question number six. In spatial terms, what is a track width? Are there ex exact adjacent tracks? How close are the tracks to each other? In temporal terms, to build a city's atmospheric image, how many revisits will be needed? And how can the revisit gap impact it? Yeah, so these are really um, important things to consider. Um, a track width, I would say uh, for OCO2, it's on the order of 20 kilometers in terms of width, okay? Um, and I think the OCO team, you know, if I had the wrong numbers, please, cor please correct me. But um, in many ways for, for a city with OCO2, you get a single track, you know, that visits it. Uh, you know, the revisit time is on the order of several weeks, okay? Now, there are other considerations. You, you could have a visit and you have a track, but um, you could have cloud coverage, right? So, so you may not gather good enough data. So the gap may actually be longer, okay? So what that means is you may not be able to get, a, let's say, very detailed variations in time, okay? Another reality, pretty much right now for all the sensors that being considered is it's a daytime sampling, right? Because you rely on reflected sunlight. So that is a you know, fundamental limitation. You, know, you don't get the nighttime emissions from the satellite because you're measuring during the day. Okay, now in terms of how many revisits, I think roughly I would say uh, rule of thumb is probably five uh, to beat down the noise and get a more robust number. Uh, so you, you need to aggregate five for each city to get a, a decent number. 
Um, I would say also you need to pull all those five together to get a single number. Right? So you're also missing some of the temporal variation. Um, again, the SAM mode could be different because it's a completely different sampling. So OCO3, in terms of exactly how those numbers play out, I would say that's partly a research question, TBD. But if you're thinking about OCO2, I was thinking about maybe five. And depending on the city, you may have to aggregate multiple years of data to get that kind of sample. Yeah, so that's all. Just just to jump in, thanks, John, for the, it, it's more like 10 kilometers. Oh, um, yeah. And, and it's 16 day revisit. Yeah, so about two weeks, that's right. Yeah, so so a pretty narrow swath. Uh, so yeah. the single track is 10 kilometer. And I know one of the previous questions as well, how do you cover the whole city? And, you know, it's tough with 10 kilometers, kind of hit and miss sometimes. But but again, I would say OCO3 SAM mode is, uh, is precisely designed to cover this target city. Great, thank you. Question number seven. To better understand how cities report their CO2 emissions, can you please point to a few cities' official CO2 reports published, either with or without OCO data, and possibly in C4 resources? Yeah, so um, I mentioned one from Salt Lake, uh, and that report is directly, we could see the link directly in that slide. Uh, and I would say many cities have official reports of what their emissions are. And I would say that the vast majority, perhaps all of them, do not use OCO data, um, which is too bad. <laughs> uh, I think partly for a lot of reasons, because sometimes these reports are compiled using sort of uh, more socioeconomic data. Staffing is limited. You know, people don't have the expertise to use the OCO data, right? Um, so there's still, that's exactly what we're trying to do here with our set training to try to bridge that that real gap. Um, but there, you, probably if you just uh, go to a lot of municipal city government's website, there would be uh, sort of publicly available reports of what they think their emissions are. Now, I would just comment, having talked to some of those people, it's very much a sort of spreadsheet type of model. There are established models um, from different groups that uh, have come up with, you know, if you have X amount of buildings with X dimensions, you know, then there are certain calculations that are done to say, well, likely the emissions are this if you need to heat it. Um, you know, so those type of uh, models are probably the dominant ones that are being used for cities reporting. Okay. And I would say that actually there's no kind of a single reporting platform. There are various kinds out there. Uh, so you sometimes, you know, you can get very different results using different types of these spreadsheet models. I think the role of what uh, we're doing here in introducing the satellite is providing an independent check, uh, a real independent source of information to try to help nail down the numbers and uh, see you know, whether some of these trends and their, these goals are being met or not. Great, and, and in addition to that, it's a standardized methodology with the use of satellite data. Yeah, that's right. So question number eight, can you please clarify for monitoring cities if we should use OCO2 and or OCO3 data? Yeah, so building on sort of what I talked about earlier, I would say both. I mean, why not use both? And, and OCO2, again, has these narrow tracks, um, so it doesn't cover often the city exactly the way you want. That being said, it provides a decent uh, sort of handle on 
on what the city is doing as a whole, you know, using sort of this these atmospheric modeling tools that I mentioned. So you get the, the, the whole city. Now, you want to really zoom into the city, different parts of the city. That's where OCO3 comes in with these, um, these SAM mode, you know, scanning through the city. And I use LA as the example in my talk. Um, you know, LA is this mega city, huge area. But potentially with the OCO3, you could nail down what's happening in, say, the Long Beach area. With, with a lot of industry and the port, right? And, and what's happening downtown, what's happening in, in sort of the eastern part of the LA Basin. You know, that's kind of uh, potentially the, the level of information we can get by combining these two satellite sensors. Okay, question number nine. What are the advantages of using SIF in comparison to NDVI for mapping the vegetation in a city? Yeah, so um, NDVI has been to the go-to sort of a ecosystem monitoring greenness index. Um, it really is trying to measure how green the vegetation is. Now, SIF, as I mentioned, is, is a byproduct of the photosynthetic me mechanism. So in many ways, through research by many people um, over the past decade, it's been shown that SIF is more closely related to photosynthesis. Okay. So I would say in many ways, SIF has an advantage for mapping vegetation, um, period, actually. Um, being the, 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 well, the key disadvantage is that um, it, it is a shorter time series because it's only been developed uh, more recently, in the past decade or so. NDVI goes back decades. Now, let me just uh, elaborate more on that. NDVI is a greenness index, right? So um, it runs into serious problems, especially with conifers, for example. So conifers, evergreen, you know, they're, they're green throughout the year. So you don't actually get uh, a very good seasonal signal, you know, what's happening with photosynthesis turning off in the winter and then turning on during the growing season. So that's a real sort of specific example of the, the advantage of SIF versus NDVI. And I should just mention that SIF is being observed by the OCO um, sensors. So it's, it's sort of co-located measurements of SIF along with XCL2. Okay, question number 10. How available are the radar data for the tropical regions of Africa? Yeah, so um, if you go to, I believe, uh, on the first slides in part two of my talk, you can see that actually there are a lot of gaps in the tropical region of Africa. Um, and um, that should be primarily because of the cloud coverage. It's, it's, there's a lot of convection, there's a lot of weather that uh, essentially affects the retrieval. So unfortunately, um, there are just not a lot of data in tropical regions, period. And I know how interesting the tropical region is as global carbon cycle kind of question and others. Did someone else want to jump in here? Did I hear someone? I'm sorry, it was me again. Uh, that it's a two-part question. And what are the processing tools? Yeah, so I would say um, it's really a, a big sampling question if you're just relying on OCO. So, so in terms of processing, you have to be careful about, you know, if you get data, what what conditions you are sampling because it might be you know, not very cloudy days, right? So that automatically introduced a potential bias. So I would say, not necessarily a processing tool, but but just being careful scientifically about what that means. Okay. I don't know if the retrieval team want to have anything in terms of the processing tools. I mean, uh, hi, this is Abhishek. Uh, more than processing, I would actually 
even take a step back and just say that while we do have gaps uh, over the tropical region, and this can be Africa or the Amazon basin or Southeast Asia, Indonesia, we do get enough high density data over this region to constrain a long term uh, and by long term, I mean like seasonal or interannual variations in fluxes. And there are uh, several publications that have actually used the data from OCO2 to look at the changes over the tropics. And um, some of them are referred to in part three of the session or part three of this training. Having said that, it's true that if you want to specifically address changes that are happening within a week or within a day, then we might just have enough missing data or gaps in the data that it is hard to address processes or flux changes that are occurring at this very short time scales. Um, so I just want to make sure that everyone is aware of that. Yeah, it's not hopeless. It's it's there are data, um, and also I'll just add an abstract. You should jump into uh, SIF again is is a real asset here. If you're interested mm -hmm. in yeah. the vegetation, in Africa, the SIF retrieval is less sensitive to cloudiness, so you can actually get pretty good coverage in the tropics with SIF. So agreed. Mm -hmm. yeah, you you, you want to. If you're interested in the vegetation, you want to combine both SIF and XCO2. Great. Question number 11. In session one, it was mentioned that OCO2 records at wavelengths of 1600 nanometers. Landsat 8 also has a shortwave infrared band of about 1600 nanometers. Is it possible to use Landsat 8 to measure CO2 in the atmosphere? <laughs> this is definitely out of my wheelhouse, so I'll defer to Vivian or others on this. So I could take that one. Thanks, John. Um, I would say no, and the reason being that the Landsat measurements are like broadband band measurements. The thing that allows us to use um, the OCO2 and OCO3 measurements to measure atmospheric CO2 is that we have high spectral resolution measurements across that region. Great, thank you, Vivian. And question number 12, what is the height range, min and max height, of the air column measured by OCO2 and OCO3? Yeah, so the air column is, you know, stretch is pretty low and, and pretty high, you know, all the way, I would say, most of the atmosphere. Um, now, there is something called the averaging kernel, which means that you don't weigh each part of the atmosphere the same sort of amount. Okay? There's also just consideration of air density, how much, how many molecules there are of air, but it stretches pretty low. Um, down near the ground, all the way through the stratosphere, for instance. Vivian, did you want to add anything on that? Yeah, I, just to reiterate that we're looking at the whole atmosphere, but we're, um, yeah, the averaging kernel tells you about the weighting throughout the atmosphere, but it, it's relatively evenly weighted. Great, thank you. All right, so that is the, oh, one more question. How do you verify, validate the results of OCO2 and three estimate accuracy? Because in this, with this method, satellite data is used with very low resolution. Yeah, so um, what you want to do is to really combine that um, 
combine the satellite measurement with a different measurement uh, as a potential independent check. So uh, examples include estimates using the ground-based data. Um, so, so if you have an independent estimate using the ground-based data, you know that could be a real check to the um, the satellite data. And it's something that I think will become uh, more common in terms of published works. Um, I, I can imagine LA being one that which uh, lots of researchers will use. There are other other cities as well. Where Salt Lake could be used, uh, it's a smaller city, so the signal is smaller. So I, I can imagine people starting with the easier problem and, and looking at bigger cities first. But the idea is, like a lot of scientific endeavors, you want to use multiple methods and, and independently check each other. Okay, thank you very much, John. All sure. right, so that is now our last question. Um, I So that concludes this webinar series. I'd just like to summarize um, everything that's been covered. This has been an excellent introductory webinar covering the XCO2 measurements, the characteristics of the measurements, biases, understanding the data. Uh, that was the first presentation by Vivian Payne. Karen Yuen did um, a great demo using Jupyter Notebook. Um, showing you how to access and uh, open and visualize OCO2 and OCO3 data. Abhishek Chatterjee talked about the use of OCO2 and OCO3 for global and regional scale studies, while well, today's presentation was focused on um, more localized studies at the urban scale. So you, it, it's provided a really great overview of not only the measurements and the use of the measurements, but how you can use them for different types of studies. Uh, the questions have been great, and I think they've really provided a, a, an insight on the topics that participants would like to learn more about. So these are things to consider potentially for a follow-up webinar in the future, something more of an intermediate level. Uh, please uh, do not forget to fill out the survey. We will be sending a survey out to everyone that participated. Um, and uh, your feedback is very important to help inform us on uh, the, the strengths of this training and what you liked and what you would like to see more of in the future to help you use XCO2 data from OCO2 and OCO3. A reminder to everyone that there is a homework associated with this training, and the homework will be posted on the training website uh, by Monday, by this Monday, and the homework will be due on Thursday, June 23rd. So with that, I would like to thank the entire RSET team, Selwyn hudson Adoy, Jonathan O'Brien, Sarah Kutshaw, as well as all of our guest speakers, uh, Vivian Payne, Karen Yuen, Abhishek Chatterjee, and John Lin, and a special thanks to Sagar Limbu. Um, so before we close, actually all of our guest speakers are here. I would like to just uh, give them uh, the, the, the floor for a, a few parting words. So let's start with Vivian. So I'll just, I'll just reiterate the thanks to all our participants and for all the great and insightful questions. Um, to the RSET team, this has been a new experience for me. I'm so impressed with how these things run. Thank you so much for all that goes into putting these together and Erica, um, stellar job. Um, and also just reiterate thanks thanks to, to our other speakers for, for all the great material. And um, we look forward to your feedback. Thank you so much. Thank you, Vivian. Karen, any words from you? Uh, I would uh, basically echo what Vivian has said. Um, I'm, uh, thank you so much for folks uh, for joining us for this series. This has been something that we've wanted to do, and it's great to see participants. And please continue with um, your questions. And um, I'm trying to <laughs> answer questions and follow up with people when they email me. Um, I apologize if I'm a little bit behind for some folks. Uh, please give feedback.
I'd love to continue this into an intermediate training. So your feedback and what you'd like to see is very helpful for how we want to organize things for, for future trainings. And um, thank you to the RSET team and thank you for the OCO2 and OCO3 team members. Thank you, Karen. Uh, Abhishek, any closing words from your part? Uh, no, would just reiterate what Vivian and Karen already said. I certainly want to thank all the participants for joining, um, and I'm certainly looking forward to their feedback and comments on what we can do to improve this training session, what might make the data more useful, and uh, how everyone is planning to use this data for their scientific investigations. And then certainly I want to take a moment uh, for a round of applause for you, Erica, and then for the entire RSET team. This could not have been possible without your help and uh, all the hard work that you all put in. So thank you again. And uh, yeah, I just think overall it's been a great session and looking forward to the reviews and feedback. Thank you very much, Abhishek. And uh, John, our, our speaker today, any closing words from your part? Uh, I just want to thank uh, all the audience for 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 listening and uh, our set team for putting together a great training session and um, and that's all. Thank you. Thank you very much. It, it's been uh, really wonderful working with all of you. And of course, thank you to all of the participants for uh, your interest and your enthusiasm in these topics and, and all of your great questions. As you know, if you have any further questions, please feel free to reach out either to me um, or to any of the uh, presenters during this session. Um, so wishing you all a, a great day and hoping that you will start exploring these data. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.